Amen. Well, I'm excited about New Year and what's going on in our church. And so far, what I've done is every year we've had a theme for our year that we carry for the missions conference and with everything we do. And so this year we're starting a new theme, and we've got it up here on the screen. And you'll see the screen a lot because we're going to be using it a lot. And it says, reaching out, but there's two words in it that are kind of highlighted, right? Two letters, I should say, that are highlighted. And those two letters say what? Go. Go. Reaching out. To, the only way to reach out is to go. It says across the street and around the world. You know, our mission as a church is to win the lost and, and teach people about Jesus and his word. They know it more. But evangelizing is both across the street and around the world. It's in the next cubicle at work or the next office at work. It's at the grocery store. It's at wherever we're at that we're reaching out to people. We're going to people. I know our, our outreach team, we had a really good uh, start with our outreach team in last year. And I know they've, they're planning on meeting to set up some new outreaches for this year. And I'm excited about that. I think reaching out to people and getting in the community and being where we can um, touch people with the touch of Jesus and what he's done for them. Listen, that's how we affect lives. That's how we change people's lives. So, so I'm excited about doing that. And, and that's what we're supposed to be doing is reaching out and going into this world. But the question is, is reaching out only for the church or is it for each individual one of us? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we're supposed to be going. When the Bible talks about going or reaching out or whatever, is that talking to the individual or to the group? When the Bible speaks about reaching out, it says, And ye shall be witnesses unto me. Okay, we're to be his witnesses of what Jesus done, like that song. I've never heard that song before. Did anybody hear that freely, freely before? Oh, some of y'all know it? Okay. I didn't know that one, but I like it because it's talking about giving the gospel freely to people. Giving it out freely. Well, the Bible says, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Now, as I looked at that verse, I, I said, okay, Jerusalem. That's our area here. We're supposed to reach people in Cyprus and all Judea. That was more of the state. You know, we could say Texas or maybe even our country, right? And the uttermost part of the earth, we know that's missions to other countries, right? But did you catch that? And in Samaria? That's very interesting that it's in Samaria because Judea was one state. Samaria was another state. They were very close. Jesus walked through it. We understand that it's talked about in the Bible. But the other ones related to regions, like Jerusalem, that was where they were at. Judea was their state. The uttermost part of the earth is around the world, but Samaria is kind of duplicating of Judea, a state, a local area. And I thought that was pretty interesting. We know what we're supposed to be doing. And in the Bible, there's two really famous stories, I think, about Samaria, right? There's two stories that really encapsulate most... The two most famous stories were the woman at the well that had five husbands and the person she was living with wasn't. Remember John chapter 4 where Jesus met the woman at the well? That was in Samaria. He says, I must need to go through Samaria. And in that story, if you remember it, she was so shocked that Jesus would talk to her. You know, she was like, I can't believe you talked to me. A man of being Jewish talking to me, a Samaritan woman? I mean, that was so anti-culture, both the Jewish to Samaria, man to woman. And it was just so odd that she was even taken aback that Jesus would talk to her. Well, the second story we know is the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. That's where we spend most of our time today. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 10. But here's a story of a Good Samaritan that Jesus tells about somebody from Samaria. I'm trying to find out why he mentioned Jerusalem, all Judea, and Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth, when he's talking about us reaching out and going. Right? Why did he bring up Samaria? 
What is the Bible trying to tell us about reaching out? Is it says it's supposed to reach out to Samaritans or Samaria. So I want to look at the story of the Good Samaritan this morning and see if we can find some principles about reaching out in this story. If you're in your Bible, Luke chapter 10, let's read verse 25 through 37. Luke 10, 25 says this, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question, isn't it? When we're talking about reaching out, how do we inherit eternal life? Verse 26, he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, That thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So he asked the question, What do I have to do to, to attain eternal life? And he says, What's the law say? Now, remember, was this guy a lawyer? He knows the law. Okay? If you got your bulletins to look back, number one, many people want religious validation. Religious validation. They want to be validated. They want to be affirmed of what they think is right. Right? The example of a person who thinks that they have all the answers comes to Jesus, a lawyer. I got all the answers. I got it figured out. And so he comes to Jesus, and he went to Jesus to show how good he was, how smart he was. He asked Jesus what he had to do to gain eternal life, and he thought he knew the answer, right? He came to Jesus. He's trying to trick Jesus, but also he's trying to show how good he is. Now, Jesus, uh, what do I need to do to, be, to attain eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what does the law say? He asks a lawyer what the law says. And then he says... Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus says up to him, check that last verse 28 out. Verse 28 says, And he said to him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. You got it figured out. There's a word in there that might be missing from what was going on with his lawyer. It's called do. Go do it. You see, today, um, this lawyer might be a modern-day legalist. What do I have to do? What are the rules I have to follow to go to heaven? What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Give me a list of things that I need to do or not do to be right with God. And wouldn't that be easier? I wish I just had Ten Commandments to follow. Even one of the Ten Commandments wasn't repeated in the New Testament. Did you know that? But in the garden, how many rules did they have? And you know what? As simple as that sounds, we probably would have messed up too. You see, these people don't want to have a relationship with God. They want to have a set of rules that they can follow. And if I just check these boxes off, I'm good. And this lawyer, he thought he already knew that he was doing them. I got it. And Jesus, maybe when he answered this, gave a little emphasis. Thou hast answered right, this do. This do, and thou shalt live. Maybe he was poking at this lawyer right here by saying, hey, yeah, you know the rules. Now let's do them. You see, Jesus told him what he wanted to hear. You're right. Now, it was the truth. Listen, if we love the Lord our God with all our, with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, and we love people, we're going to have salvation because we're going to find God if we know Him in our heart, soul, and mind, right? And we use our strength to, to do what He says. We're going to know God, and we're going to have a relationship with Him. And this was the truth, but it's what He wanted to hear, this lawyer. That's what He wanted to hear. He wasn't, the problem was with the lawyer, though, He wasn't applying what the law said completely. You see, He was applying part of it. He was being a religious fanatic. I don't know if you want to say that because he was following the law, but he was, he was following all the religious rules, and I've got that. You see, so many of us, we know the Bible, what it says, but applying the Bible to our life is a different story. Living out the Bible daily is a lot harder than knowing it. You, you, you guys, we should all come to that understanding. It's a lot easier to know than to do. You know what I'm saying? 
I mean, come on, let's apply this to our life real quick here. Do you know that eating that pecan pie over Thanksgiving and Christmas is going to add some LBSs? <laughs> right? We know it, but it's hard not to eat it, right? We know what's good for us, but living I shouldn't have another piece. <laughs> but I'm going to, right? We know what's good for us, but doing it's harder. We know that we need to get more exercise in 2016. I work out at, at our neighborhood's gym, and I dread January, about January, February, and about half of March. Because New Year's resolutions. People come into the gym, and it's full. And it already started this week, and it's full. And I'm like, oh, man. About March, they quit. You know, it's over. But January and February, you know, it's full. Because why? We know what we should do. But after March, it's hard to keep doing it, isn't it? If you keep your New Year's resolutions to March, you're probably doing pretty good. Because we know what we should do. It's hard to do it. And this lawyer knew what he was supposed to do. But Jesus was telling something. You see, most people apply what they like and what they want from the Bible and get rid of the rest. I I'm telling you, Every one of us do this. Me, you, we all do this. We read the Bible. Oh, I like that. Yeah, let's, let's use that. Oh, that next verse. Uh, I don't like that. I'm going to forget that verse. You know, we might as well just take scissors and cut it out of the Bible. Because we know, but we don't do. We know what we like, but we're not going to do what we don't like. And that's what this lawyer did. He picked what he liked. He was applying the first part, but didn't want to apply the second part. What was the first part? And he answered, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. He got that. He was living a very strict life that was very following the law. And thy neighbor as they sell. What would be loving our neighbors ourselves today? Maybe telling your neighbor about salvation. Don't you want, aren't you glad somebody told you about salvation? Aren't you, wouldn't you want somebody to come and tell you if you weren't saved? Love thy neighbor as thyself. When the lawyer realized that his answer called him to do more than he was doing, he tried to justify himself. Look in verse 29. He says, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, Well, who's my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? Well, see, the law was very ambiguous there to him, right? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Well, listen, what if I don't know who my neighbor is? Right? What if I don't understand this? Most people... When their ideas are questioned, look for ways out instead of looking for the truth. Jeremy, most people, when their ideas are questioned, look for a way out to get around it rather than looking for the truth. What's the truth here? <coughs> now I get in, I talk to different pastors, missionaries, and stuff, and, and I'll argue with something with somebody, or not argue, but you know, we'll do debate about the Bible. And me, I go home and I think through what was said. What's the truth? Do I need to change something? Or at least I try to do that. I don't always do that. I can't say I always do, but I try to. You see, the lawyer thinks if he can redefine who his neighbor is, he can justify not loving his neighbor. If I could just redefine who my neighbor is. If we ask today who your neighbor is, what would you... What would your answer be? If I ask you, what was your who was your neighbor? Maybe some of you know your neighbors who live next door, the house around you, and you might start naming them. Maybe some someone here knows all their neighbors on their street. They're the neighborhood watch captain. They know everybody. You know? That's not what the Bible is talking about here when it talks about love our neighbors or so. Number two this morning, we have to ask the question, who is your neighbor? Who is your neighbor? Look at verses 30 through 36. And Jesus answering, after he asked this question, well, who is my neighbor? Said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. 
And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and, and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, Jesus asked, which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? So when Jesus is asked who our neighbor is, this is the story he tells. The story of the Good Samaritan. See, Jesus wanted to illustrate to this lawyer and to us today, who should we love? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus wants to define who that is. He told the story about this person, this Jewish man probably, because he's coming from Jerusalem. He's going along the way, and he's attacked, led for dead. See, the first verse says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem. So we're talking about a Jewish man here. Letter A there in your outline, a priest came by. Now, who's a priest? The main job of a priest was to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. This is the person that when somebody would come and bring a sacrifice, and they would kill it and offer it on the altar. Why? To bring peace between man and God. It was a person that was uniting God and man. This is the religious person that should care about people. They also kept the fire burning at the altar, so there was always fire there to offer sacrifice. And they were supposed to know the law and should be able to apply it if they know it, right? He came by and saw this, this Jewish man, a priest, that offers sacrifice for Jewish people, comes by, and what did he do? He passed by on the other side. He ignored the one in need. You know, that's what some churches and some Christians do, don't we? We ignore that there's a need out there. We ignore that there's lost people that are dying and going to hell. We ignore that there's countries with very few churches. There's huge mega cities with millions of people with very few gospel preaching. And I'm not talking just about Baptists. I'm talking about somebody who actually preaches the gospel, whether they're whatever, Methodist or whatever religion that preaches that salvation is in Jesus Christ alone and in, in the belief in his death, burial, and resurrection. There are cities with millions of people who have very few churches. Can you imagine if the city of Houston only had three or four churches that preach the gospel in the whole city of Houston? There's cities almost as big as Houston with only three or four churches preaching the gospel. Now, you and I can ignore that, and we can say, well, we go to church and we love God, so that, but how are we supposed to have a God love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor? Jesus said, you know, you're supposed to be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, Judea. He puts in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. We're supposed to care about people around the world, and we are not supposed to ignore people that need the gospel. We are not supposed to just, well, don't look, don't look, and it won't, it won't affect us if we don't look. That's what this priest did. He ignored the problem, and he just went to the other side of the road. I don't see anything, I don't see anything. And walked on by. And there's many churches and many Christians doing that today. They don't care about their neighbor. They're just going to ignore the problem. Next, the Levite came by. Now, these were the assistants to the priests. They carried the tabernacle and the instruments that were used inside. They were to care for the instruments of the temple. Okay? So what did he do? Now, this is a person that's more of the commoner, right? I mean, he's not the priest. He's the commoner, and he helps make connect people to God. He knows the law, and he should follow it too. What did you catch what the Bible said here? And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now, he didn't ignore him. He didn't ignore him. He looked at him, but didn't offer any help. He saw the need and chose not to answer. 
So there might be some of you who say, yes, there's a need for the gospel to be preached around the world. There's a need for my neighbor to be saved. There's a need for people, more churches to be started in Texas and the U.S. There's a need for churches around the world. We need to see people saved around the world. You see the need, you go, but what can I do? I'm just one person. We know the need, but we don't act. You see, our missions program is a program that we send missionaries. And we, through our missions program, we start churches in Texas. We start churches in the U.S. We help churches start on the mission field. We send missionaries. We help Bible colleges that will educate ministers to start more churches. That's what our missions program does. Because we know there's a need and we want to do something. Some people in our church, and I'm, gonna, you know, I'm about to make somebody mad, and that's okay. Because I'm going to tell the truth. There's some people that know there's a need for people to be one around the world, and they won't give. I know the need, but I'm not going to act. I'm just going to, I see the problem. I know there's a problem. But the Levite passed on the other side too. First guy ignores it. There's no problem. There's nobody there. La, 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 walks by, right? The second guy looks at him. Man, he's, he's still alive. Man, somebody needs to help this guy, but I'm going over here. Walks on by. The third person, a certain Samaritan. A Samaritan. Now, a Samaritan was a half-Jewish person. Okay? Now, remember, the law said you're only supposed to marry Jewish people. So the lawyer, let's listen to the story, the priest and the Levite know what a Samaritan is, right? They have not followed the law. They're sinful. They have turned their back on the true faith. They are half Jewish. They've ignored it and they're impure and they're not pure. And they were hated by the Jewish people because they didn't follow the law and only married Jewish people. They were hated. You see, the Jews in Jerusalem refused to allow Samaritans to take part with them in rebuilding the temple after they returned from captivity. They told these people that were half Jews, half Gentiles, go somewhere else. We're building the temple. You cannot participate. And hence sprang up enmity or anger between them. The Samaritans erected a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Remember when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well? And she says, well, we have a temple. They erected their own temple on Mount Gerizim, which was, however, destroyed by a Jewish king in B.C. before Christ, 130 years before Christ. Then they built another one at Shechem. The bitter enmity between the Jews and the Samaritans continued into the time of our Lord. The Jews had no dealings with Samaritans, according to John chapter 4, verse 9. Remember the woman? She said to Jesus, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. <coughs> they understood, and it was quite obvious that they had segregated themselves apart. They had nothing to do with each other. They hated each other. They had different temples. They, they didn't like each other, and there was nothing going to happen. But yet this one, it was a Samaritan, saw this Jewish man, it was hated, beaten, and half dead. <clears throat> but a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, where the guy was down, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Did you hear the one word difference between the, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan? Compassion. Love. He cared. You ever feel like sometimes you're the one that's been beaten up and thrown down and life's just beating you up and here comes a priest by and walks on by. And here comes somebody else that should love me and care for me and they walk on by and then your enemy comes by and you go, well, I'm not going to give you help here. But this Samaritan showed compassion. He had compassion on verse 34 and went to him and bound up his wounds. And pouring, pouring in oil and wine, he used his money and his valuable possessions to help this one hurt. And set him on his own beast and, and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave to them to the host and said unto him, 
Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. This Samaritan offers his energy, his resources, and, and gives money to take care of him in the future. The one that should hate him and not care for him at all is the one that does something, that acted. He had compassion on the one that was attacked. And because of compassion, he cleaned and bound his wounds. He carried him to the next town and cared for him. And when he left, he paid for his future care. We, we have three different things that we can do with those in need. We can ignore them. I'm talking about spiritually in need. We can ignore them. We can ignore the problem. We see them, but we'll just ignore that there's a problem. Or we can do something about it. That's our three choices this morning. And there's spiritual need around this world. What are we going to do? Ignore that they, there's even a problem? Ignore the problem because we don't want to spend the time or we're going to do something. Number three this morning. Number three. Do you act <coughs> neighborly? Do you act neighborly? Look in verse 37. Jesus asked the question in verse 36, when now, uh, Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among thieves? Verse 37, he said, the lawyer says, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do likewise. You catch that one word we've been talking about? Do. You know, but you're not doing. Go and do Likewise. So do you act neighborly? According to the story, who's our neighbor? I want to give some, some, maybe some people that could be our neighbor. It could be anyone who needs your help. The story, there was a man who needed help. One acted, and that was the neighbor to him, right? One that cared for him because he acted. It could be somebody that's in need and needs your help. James 1.27 says, Pure religion Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We're supposed to care about those who can't help themselves. The, the New King James, in, instead of affliction, used those widows in their trouble. Now, you know, um, the Bible defines what a widow indeed is in, in certain things, and and we're not saying that, that everybody's a widow needs care. Some ladies and men can take care of themselves and everything, but there are certain widows that can't. And pure religion, none to fall before God, is to do something for somebody who's in need and cares for, or to visit the fatherless and take care of the kids that don't have fathers, orphans. Doing something. You see... We can have a relationship with God and we can be saved without acting. I believe. But I don't think that's going to be a happy believer or a joyful believer that knows there's a need, knows people are hurting, and is ignoring it. I'm not going to do anything. Because Jesus says the one that was the neighbor was the one that went to somebody in need and helped. Maybe you know somebody in need that you need to be a neighbor to, spiritual or physical. There's a need. Well, maybe this. Oh, I, I hate to say this, but it could be your most hated enemy. To be neighborly to someone, maybe this person that you need to be neighborly to is your most hated enemy. Matthew 5, 44 says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use and persecute you. The Bible must not know what it's talking about. When people are abusing us and, and talking bad about us, we're supposed to pray for them and care for them? Here comes the Samaritan. And he's been called all kinds of names by Jewish people. And he's been told he can't come and worship where the real place of worship is. And you can't have anything to do with our church. And we don't even want to talk to you. And he's walking along and he sees one of the people who's been saying stuff like this to him. Now, a lot of us, if we are walking down the road, 
Maybe there's a Muslim beat up and hurt. We're supposed to love our enemies, do good to them, pray for them, care for them. And if you and I walked down the road and saw a Muslim person laying on the side of the road, beaten up, would we stop? Because this Samaritan guy did to the one that he hated, that hated him. He chose to love and act despite that. And the Bible tells us that we're supposed to love our enemies and bless them that curse you and do good to them who hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Sounds like to me we're supposed to be praying loving Muslim people, doesn't it to you? What about a gay activist that's beaten up? Do we stop and care for them? Or do we say, you got what you deserved? You know, that Samaritan could have done that. He could have said, you know what? You deserve this because you've been so ugly to us Samaritans. You deserved to get beaten up. In fact, the whole, that's not what he does. He had compassion. He stopped and he did something. According to this story, what should we do to people? We should have compassion for people. The first thing that was different about the Samaritan was that he had compassion. Do we really care about people? Do we really have compassion for hurting people and people who don't know God? If we do, we'll do something about their biggest need, won't we? If we really have compassion, we're going to do something about their biggest need. Second thing, we need to help them immediately, give immediate help. Help the immediate need. He gave first aid that was needed immediately. He stopped down, he bound up his wounds, he poured in oil and wine and cleaned the wounds, and he took care of those first needs. We must first meet people's needs to help them with their biggest need. We, have, we went down in February and drilled a water well for a community that didn't have water, that didn't have clean water. And we did it on the back of a church property. That's strategic right there. You know, we're going to meet their need and they can freely go get that water. Anybody in that community, whether you go to that church or not, can freely go get that water. But because we met their needs... Because we cared about their immediate need, some of them stood around and heard a gospel message and accepted Jesus as their Savior. Because we met the immediate need and they saw that we cared. What's the third thing to do? We need to provide for future needs. He then put his finances on the line to meet his neighbor's need. Are we willing to give to missions to meet needs of the lost in this world? Are we willing to pay to have the gospel preached in another state, in another city? Are we willing to meet people's needs ourselves? Are we willing to say, I will meet their needs because this guy that was called a neighbor by Jesus was willing to pay? He used his resources, his oil, his wine. He cleaned him up. He put him on his animal. He took him to the inn. And then he gave money on the next day and says, hey, here's enough to take care of me. And if there's more, I will come and repay it. You know, a lot of us say that, or not a lot of us, a lot of people say, well, listen, if those Muslims don't have Jesus, that's their own fault. They should know about him. That's what the priest and the Levite did. They walked on the other side and says, well, I don't care about your need. I'm going to ignore your need. I'm going to ignore the problem. We're not going to deal with it. Did you catch what he did? He had compassion. He helped the immediate need. He provided for future needs. We need to be willing to start a church. And you know what? We might have to... Can I tell you what happened here? East Texas bought this property and made payments for this property while this church started meeting here until this church got on its feet. You know what they did? They saw a need to had compassion. They bought a property, met the immediate need of a place to meet, and then they met the future needs by continuing to pay the payment. Don't you think that if somebody did that for us, we should do that for somebody else? We should help other churches. So here's the question. Who would this story be about in your life? Who's this story about? Would Jesus tell about a Muslim man who fell among thieves and you walked by? What would you do? 
Would Jesus tell about a, a homosexual person that had been hurt by this world and need to be loved? And, and, and you knew that they needed somebody to talk to and they, they'd been hurt by this world and we said, mm, get right first and then I'll talk to you. Is it the hated person in your life that God might be calling you to help? To be a neighbor? You know, I, I imagine after this Jewish man was healed and recovered, I bet he began to have some compassion and care about Samaritans. Don't you think? I mean, he was laying on the road. He sees a priest. That guy doesn't help. A Levite comes by, doesn't help. And this guy that comes, he finds out, is a Samaritan. And, and his whole life, he's hated Samaritans. Do you think his attitude changed towards Samaritans? Why? Compassion, care, love. A Samaritan had taken the first step towards him and had loved him. You know, maybe these, these groups that hate us, we need to take the first step towards them. Love them. Show them the love of Christ because he died for them and cares. You see, the one that was the neighbor was the one who cared, acted, and provided. Right? The one that was the neighbor was the one that had compassion. He cared. He stopped. He acted. And then he provided. You see, we're supposed to go and do likewise, as he, as this guy, as Jesus told this lawyer, who was the neighbor. And he said, the one that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. We're supposed to go do likewise. We're supposed to meet people's biggest need for the gospel. We're supposed to have compassion. We're supposed to care, act, and provide. If we want to be a neighbor. If we want to be people who care. You see, I asked a question to be in the service. Is, is this about being a neighbor? Is it about the individual or the church? Is it something we do as a group or as individuals? And my answer to that is yes, both. We are supposed to individually look for people that are hurting spiritually, <coughs> physically, and help them. We as a church are supposed to help start other churches in areas that need help and care for them. We're supposed to give them the gospel. And we're supposed to help them move around the table. You remember the table illustration? We're supposed to bring people to that table and then help as a church. We're supposed to bring, and as individuals, we're supposed to bring in the table and then help them move around the table spiritually to mature. That's our job. I think this illustration, the illustration table fits this story pretty good. We're supposed to care for people and bring them to the table meet their needs to help them move around the table. We're supposed to give them the truth. I think both the church and the, and, and the individuals need to work with compassion and act to help them move. But if we're going to accomplish the mission God has for us, we're going to have to reach out. We're going to have to reach out to our neighbors. And who's our neighbors? One's in need. One's hurting. One's that don't know the truth. So our goal this year, our theme this year, is reaching out. And the last G and the first O tell us how we're going to have to do it. Go. Reaching out to our neighbors. Reaching out to our friends. Reaching out to people around the world with the gospel. Reaching out and telling people God loves you. He cares for you. Helping them with immediate needs. Helping them with, them with long term needs. Helping missionaries start churches. But each one of us telling people about Jesus and caring for them. Are you willing to be reaching out this year? Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you and we look at the story. and God, it's a simple story so easy, but at the same time it can impact us so much. Lord, we need to be people who don't ignore problems pass by on the other side. We need to be people who care and stop and see a need, meet a need. Who love you, who are 
more obedient to your Holy Spirit when you tell us to love our enemies? You tell us to act and go help the widow and the fatherless? That those acts of compassion can lead to a relationship with you. Help us to be a church reaching out this year in missions, in local, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, and everything we do would point people to you and bring them around the table.